Welcome everybody. God bless you guys. Thank you for being here. Today is Friday. Good Friday. Good, good Friday because God is a good, good father. Hope everybody's having a good day and ready for their weekend. It's been a good day for me. God is good. God is definitely good. Let's go ahead and pray and then get into this Romans chapter 12. All right, let me make sure that's good. All right, cool. So, Father God, we thank you for this day that you have made, O oh Lord. May you be glorified in everything and all things, O oh God. We love you, O oh Lord, and we appreciate all that you are doing in our lives. We are now worthy, O oh Father. We ask that you remind us of your goodness oh father and show us what it is that you are doing give us instruction in what you would like us to do oh father help us to continue the course of faith with our eyes set upon you and the future that you have promised oh god you are mighty you are holy and you are righteous you are perfect and you are matchless oh father we thank you oh god for our lives and what you are doing oh father we thank you for your grace oh lord your mercy your perfection, O oh Father. We ask that you would help us, O oh Lord, to continue to grow and be the Christians that you desire for us to be, to be the men and women that you desire for us to become. May you be glorified in all things, O oh Father, for you are worthy of praise and honor. I pray for your children in this moment, O oh Father, that you would give us wisdom to study this word. Help us in our affliction, O oh Father, and increase our faith that we may have the hope that we need to accomplish all the promises that you have. Remove all distractions, O oh Father. Bless our homes, bless our marriages, bless us and our finances and our families. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. God bless you guys. <coughs> Thank you for being here. Was eating, this is probably my favorite candy bar. I tried it like six months ago. I don't know if you guys remember that, but I went to Target earlier um, and I saw this. It's Hershey's that has the popping candy in it. And it's so, I don't know if it, I don't like it because of what it tastes like. I just like it because it's such a fun experience. It's like the popping candy. You eat it chocolate, it's popping. So it's limited edition, you know, because we bougie. So go get some Target Hershey's popping candy. <laughs> but did a few errands today, went to the gym. Went to the flower shop, got my boo thing, some flowers, my future wifey, wherever she at. I did tell you guys that I got her flowers on March 8th for, for Women's Day. 
Let me put it in front of y'all so y'all can see how beautiful. I think tulips are so cool. Oh, man, I dropped some tea. Um, tulips are so cool. Can it focus or what? Oh, look at that. Look at how cute. And like pink. All right, so my favorite colors are red, pink, blue, and baby blue. Or like powder blue. So I got the pink ones. And I get them like when they're clothes because they last longer the other ones that i got they died so quickly i didn't i didn't enjoy that but anyways for the woman of my dreams there we go for whenever she decides to show up in my life they'll be there waiting for her <laughs> anyways all right let me make sure this is clean because then i'm gonna stain myself this is one of my favorite linen shirts. I'm dressed like I'm ready to go sip some pina coladas on the beach somewhere with my boat thing. I need to go on a vacation ASAP. I miss the beaches in Florida, man, because it'd be too cold at these California waters. Anyways, let's get into this Bible study. So we're on Romans chapter 12. We're almost done, guys. It's crazy to think that, ooh, when did we start Romans? I don't know. I don't remember. Has it been two months in Romans already? Because that would be crazy. Anyways, I think it's like a month or something we've been in Romans, but we got four more chapters until 16 and then we're Gucci. So, okay. Okay. Let's read this. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. This is a very important chapter. Paul is instructing the Romans what it means to be a Christian. Verse 1. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual wor worship. Okay. I wonder if we should get into this right now. Yeah, I think this is a good time to get into this. Let me change this text to take out the f cross references and the footnotes. Okay. Look at what Paul says here. I appeal to you, therefore, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. That is a crucial verse right there. Because what is Paul telling us? That literally your life is worship to God. So I think one of the greatest misfortunes within the church is how we have categorized worship to be singing. We're, uh, we got to say this. Praise is worship, but worship is not praise. Just so we understand that. Worship is the overarching term. It's the overarching glorifying of God. Underneath worship, there is a portion of that, which is praise. But listen, anything that you do is worship unto God. Hey, 20 bucks. Thank you. Be the bond. It's been a minute. I haven't seen you in a while. God bless you. Thank you for the 20 bucks. That's awesome. God bless you. It's been a while. It's been a while. Welcome back. So worship and the reason why I think this is so unfortunate is because it puts us in a mentality that's not conducive to. How can I say this? If we think that praise is literally worship, like it's worship is praise or, or you know, like if you make worship praise what you do by doing that is you sacrifice everything that is worship on the altar of praise and it puts you in a mentality to think that you are worshiping god only when you are singing songs and that's not what worship is praise is worship but worship is not praise worship is worship worship is devotion and intentional attention on god did i say attentional intentional intentional attention directed towards god so that's anything and song doesn't have to be involved in that 
Worship is literally anything. And what I like to tell young men is you can worship God playing video games. And I know that sounds crazy. And the reason why I say that is to be very, whenever there's, whenever there's a, an idea that's radical, in order to get the idea back on track, you have to say an equally radical thing, like in its opposition. Because what it does is if you say a, a, a statement as equally exaggerative as the mis the the misattributed notion this statement pulls the notion back to equilibrium but it has to be equally as outrageous as this idea because if you just say a regular statement that is within equilibrium what does it do it doesn't do anything there's too much slack of the rope if you can imagine that a rope is attached so I know how ridiculous that sounds that worship is praise, right? And that, that's the misnomer. That's the misconception. But in order to disrupt that completely, worship can be video games, okay? And I know that sounds ridiculous to people because it's like, what do you talk about? How can I play video games be worship? I'm going to explain because I would say like washing dishes is, is worship. Sweeping, mopping is worship. And the reason why I don't just default to that is because, you know, maybe song could be involved in that. But even more so, you already see that as service. So I don't want to associate that. That would be a statement in the middle. It wouldn't be enough to to bridge the gap. Right. It, it wouldn't be enough. So how is it that uh, an activity such as video games could be worship with God? Anything that you do. You have to get out the mentality that God is associated with certain things as if God exists here and then reality exists here. No, God is reality. God is reality. There is no reality outside of God. There is no substance outside of God. And I'm going to talk to you guys about hell in a second so that you could really understand what I'm saying. And it's going to blow your mind because I know we don't have this idea. And it'll help you with many questions you may be wrestling with is how can a good God send people to hell? Everybody has that question. But let's stay here on the topic of video games. Or let's say getting your hair done as a woman could be worship to God. Getting your nails done could be worship to God. Now, there's different levels of worship, right? Playing video games is not the same level of worship as um, worshiping in church through praise or prayer right it's not the same level obviously there's just different levels of consecration different levels of uh sacredness different levels of connection with god but don't take the video games to be even though i don't really play i i, I don't play video games like that I, I told you guys before a couple months that i was to like reach my one of my best friends who's atheist which that did work but then he started uh, working and I, I, I don't do it anymore because I was only doing it for him. Um, but playing video games, what it is, is if you use it not just as a means to um, relax and enjoy your leisure time, but that you use it, you use it intentionally to be engaged with God. So let's put it, let's make it a more, let's make this a more universal activity then watching movies could be worship and i know it sounds strange but i would go to the movie theaters alone i would go to the movie theaters alone i'll watch a disney movie i'll watch a i don't know what like a superhero movie or and what was the last oh i went with my friend daniel i didn't get to take a picture but this was like two weeks ago we went to go see dune 2 and the entire time I'm in the movie theater with Daniel, I'm watching the movie. Incredible movie, that, by the way. You should go watch it. The entire time that I'm watching the movie, I'm engaging the movie in conversation with God in my head. Because when we do activities, we have, these, we have this activity in our brain. Our, the, our neurological function of what's happening there, I mean, we don't know what consciousness is. We have no scientific uh, explanation for consciousness. But whatever thinking is... You, you typically just think to yourself as if those th thoughts come from nowhere or you created them or they're outside forces. The devil put thoughts in your brain. Um, but 
if you could really get into the habit of directing all of your thoughts towards God, number one, that's exactly what prayer is. That's why Paul says, pray without ceasing. It's you have a cognitive function through thinking that activity that's going on there. If you direct it towards God without trying to separate it into categories like this is holy, this is sacred, this is consecrated, this is not holy, this is whatever. Bring everything before God. It's like, Lord, don't the, like don't all of us want to be loved for who we are. And how come we understand that God loves us unconditionally, but then there's like parts of us that we want to hold back. Like, nah, God, you can't have access to this. Why? I want to be seen 100% like naked and bare before the eyes of God that he sees straight through my soul. And I'm putting that all on the table. Like, here you go, Father. Here's my weakness. Here's my insecurity. Here's my sin. Here's my darkness. Like, all of it here's the good and the bad the ugly and the beautiful you know here you go lord take it all and i don't think people understand that they think prayer is going to church one time a week on the prayer service or you know this is the idea of like going to church and that's when you hear the word of god like from the person that's preaching at the pulpit it's like that's unfortunate if that's where your relationship comprises of because it's so much more beautiful than that church is the place of magnification it's not the place of origination and what do i mean by that too many people are trying to find their spirituality to be originated in church but church is not the origination church is the magnification and the congregation of what we're going to get into that in in romans chapter 12 but i'm trying to make a point here your entire life is worship unto God. Every breath that you exhale and you inhale could be literally worship if you do it to the glory of God. And what does it mean to do it to the glory of God? To give, right? Like as I exhale, if I'm conscious of my exhalation and my inhalation, because these are uh, subconscious or unconscious, well, yeah, involuntary faculties of our physiolo physiology right the breathing and the and the inhale exhale that's something we don't think about but if i could just close my eyes in this moment and i just think about it then this is worship me preaching to you right now is worship i would tell you that anything that you engage god in not as a not as a spectator, but as an actual participant of your life and not just any participant, but the love of your soul, the love of your entire being and him as the lover of your life. Beloved, that is what worship is. So whether I'm playing video games, whether I'm just watching nonsense on YouTube, I'm watching a movie like Dune that they will preach on the on the pulpit like, oh, you shouldn't be watching those robotic movies. Listen, there's no such thing as I. I'm going to get a slack for this. There ain't no such thing as demonic, okay? There ain't nothing. Obviously, there is. I'm making an equally exaggerated point. You guys should already know that about me. You should understand that there needs to be this separation, right? Like, obviously, there are things that are evil. Obviously, there's things that are demonic. But if you'd say things like Harry Potter is demonic, Star Wars is demonic, Lord of the Rings, uh, whatever, Chronicles or Narnia, these things are demonic because it has like magic or it has wizards or it has actual demons. Then you're limiting yourself to a narrative that doesn't exist in reality. And the reason why these fantastical elements have such power is because they're talking ab about a reality that actually exists. So if you can engage this medium of entertainment with the critique of spirituality, engaging God with it, you have the filter that will protect you anyways. Now, I'm not trying to tell you, go watch those those movies these scary movies i used to like scary movies when i was younger but obviously when i'm christian i didn't i didn't care for it but i went to the watch the dune movie and it, it showed like three back to back uh three back to back i don't know why i just said it was gonna run the ad i don't know um three back to back uh like scary movie trailers i'm not talking about going watching that there's obviously stuff out there that's demonic but if you try to separate everything into the demonic 
you're gonna live a, a very subpar life I'm, I'm just telling you it's gonna be a very subpar life so to give you an example of how i engaged god in this movie that otherwise christians would be like you shouldn't be watching stuff like this the movie dune is a story that is actually a religious story um and this is why i find this so fascinating it it's about this man that's becoming a prophet for this offshoot group of people this oppressed group of people and he's becoming a prophet they believe that he's the messiah for their group and if you can look at these tropes or you can see these elements of the story it actually helps you understand your own christian story the bible is more akin to a fiction novel than it is a science book and what's so or even a history book what's so unfortunate about christians is they read the bible and this is why they're so bored and they can't spend more than two minutes reading the bible when they sit down to read the bible they open their bible and what they do is they read it like if this is a scientific piece of literature or they they want to read it as history and if you read it like that although there is science in here although there are historical elements to it the bible is a story did it happen or did it not happen in the sense of specific events that doesn't matter that doesn't matter like it really doesn't matter if moses lived in the year ten thousand or five thousand what matters that the actual exact day or the the narrative of the story of what it's trying to tell you so when you sit down and you read the Bible and it becomes a historical book for you, again, I'm not saying you shouldn't do that, but if that's your first engagement with the Bible versus reading it like a fictional tale, not to say that it's fiction, but your brain goes to a specific imaginative place when it engages with fantastical elements, that's what the Bible is trying to make you do. So that's what the Bible actually is. It's, it's a story. Didn't you think they were trying to make believers look backwards? Uh, which wh are you saying with Dune? And wh what do you mean were they trying to make believers look backwards? Just, just to clarify, I want to make sure what, I'm, what, what you're saying. So if you could read the Bible like a novel, when you're reading a, bi when you're reading a novel, right? If I'm reading, what's a, what's a good novel? What, what do we know? Uh, let me go to Harry Potter, right? Let me go to Harry Potter. If you're reading Harry Potter, your main thing about the story is to determine what the story is. Who are the characters? What are the places like? It's, it's, it's an inquisitive mind. It's a curious mind that you possess when you start to think about things in a novelistic way. In, in that imaginative way. So when you do that with the Bible, you, now you're, you're receiving the message that is being laid out for you by the Holy Spirit. But if you start thinking in a critical way, which is, this is only something that has happened in the church within the last like 200 years, thanks to the enlightenment and the scientific revolution that we want to be exacting on everything when the majority of history for the last like 15, 10, thousand years we have never thought of anything in that way everything that we think about is novelistic everything 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 so when you open the bible all of a sudden and you start reading these things to be exact with it you're missing the majority of the bible and that's why it's boring to you so that's why i tell certain stories about the bible in dramatic ways like I get into character. I get into the, the Bible as if it was a movie. You know what I mean? Because if you're worried about, oh, you know, th w what year exactly was Jesus born in? H hint, hint, we really don't know. What year did he die? W hint, hint, we really don't know. Okay? So you don't have to worry about these things and you don't have to engage people who, who get that specific on them. Anyways, the point is, going back to what paul is saying here hopefully it makes sense now to you i appeal to you therefore brothers by the mercies of god to present your bodies as a living sacrifice 
holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. So now th what this idea is based on is where Paul says that your body is the temple of God. He's going to get into this in a, in a minute. Your body is the temple of God. And when I say that, I wonder if you guys actually know what that means. And if you have no connection to the Old Testament, that statement makes no sense to you at all, except for the, the common understanding that your body is your temple. Therefore, it's sacred. Like, this is the importance of knowing the Old Testament just as well as you know the New Testament. Because the temple of the body of the Holy Spirit, when you really understand that your body is the temple, maybe you'll understand why you shouldn't be half naked. Maybe you'll understand why we shouldn't be putting graffiti on the temple of, of God, right? And I've heard all the arguments that I've, I've, I've needed to hear about tattoos, and I'm still not convinced. Now, people, you know, I'm not judging people. People do whatever they want. We all answer to God either way on both sides of things. Um, but when we really understand that the temple was the place of where God literally chose to cause his presence to dwell in, all you have to, to really understand what is the purpose of the temple and how powerful that imagery is and its significance that there was actually a temple that God gave instructions to Moses for. You don't got to read Leviticus where it's telling you, oh, make this quarter, you know, 10 cubits by six cubits and then put up like three furnitures there, put a lampstand there. And then you're like, oh, my God, I'm not an architect, please. Oh, my God, 67 centimeters, whatever, and three shekels or what? Like, I, you know, your brain starts to hurt. You don't have to go that deep into it. That's very beautiful for the Jewish people who that has specific significance to just like genealogies. But if you really want to know the significance of the temple, then read the Exodus story. And when they when everything that has to do with Mount Sinai, Mount Sinai is really like the first temple. Technically, Eden is the first temple. Um, technically, technically, if we're biblically speaking, Eden is the first temple for God. But then after Eden, right, Mount Sinai is the next temple. And then right on Mount Sinai, um, Moses receives the exact instructions for the actual temple. But then the temple gets built and then destroyed twice. Right. And then supposedly in the end, well, now supposedly uh, apocalyptically at the end times, it'll be built up again on the third time. So if you want to understand what is the importance of the the temple and what it means for your body to be the temple, just compare your body to the to the, all the imagery of mount sinai in the book of exodus and numbers and then you'll start to understand what what like how incredible it is that you, that paul is saying that your body is a temple so holy and acceptable to god right paul tells timothy all things and this is where i get um this is where I get the idea that nothing is inherently evil in this world. Nothing. Things have been twisted out of proportion. Things have been um, deceived or contorted to, to ways that they, they shouldn't be. Um, so, for example, so that you can understand what evil actually is. Evil doesn't exist. Shocker. I know. Evil doesn't exist. E evil is the absence of good. It's the same thing as darkness. Darkness doesn't exist if we're talking scientifically. Now, I don't want you to read the Bible that way. Continue to think about it the way that you do, that it is the opposite of light or the opposite of good. But what evil actually is, is taking the design of good. Let's say, let's say that we have a design for what good actually is. If I could say this is, let's think about it like crochet. If I could say this is the pattern of the, the the crochet pattern that I want, right? I don't know anything about crochet. I don't know why I brought up crochet, just because I'm saying pattern. Uh, this is the pattern that we're laying out. This is the design. I show you the design. What evil does is it takes the design and does the opposite of what the design was intended for. So is it that this thing is actually evil? Not necessarily. It's just the opposite pattern 
It's the anti-pattern is the technical term of the original pattern. It's the anti-schematic of what is evil. So, for example, um, things that are like anti-culture, like punk rock or goth or whatever like subcultures they are, Satanists, right? For example, they can't escape the reality that already exists. So whenever people try to do the opposite or they try to break the trend, you can't break a trend. There's no such thing as breaking a pattern. You can never escape the original pattern. It's not possible. And we know this. I don't want to speak for mathematics, but to bring it to mathematics, right? There's a fractal design for everything, meaning that this pattern can repeat over and over and over again. If you want to create something evil or an anti-pattern, all you're creating is just the opposite of what was already created. So you're not anything original. No matter how much people try to break the pattern, they end up creating the a same pattern, right? Like, and you see this the most in music. Music, we we have a pattern. This is this is the pattern of the music that we see. Let's say for Christianity. This is the pattern that we see for Christianity. I've I'm a, I've only been a Christian for so long. So I can't speak 100%. But at one point, the pattern was elevation music. Like elevation music was the pattern. And then that's all that we saw until people get tired of the pattern and they want to move to a new pattern. But in order to go from one pattern to the other pattern, you kind of have to st step out of the pattern. And then whatever you step out of to try to be creative is the pattern anyways i don't know if i'm making sense but just to put this in more terms so it went from the elevation style of music and this is coming from the most ignorant person in the world like if you don't want to listen to me that's okay i'm not educated on this i'm just making a spectator's analysis on something i know nothing about so what is this worth i don't know i'm just trying to when you're trying to learn things, you have to apply it to things you don't know to expand your mind to see if you truly understand it. So if I can explain this and this makes sense to you, then maybe I do know what I'm talking about. <laughs> I don't know. So elevation, and maybe that wasn't the pattern, but that's all that I recognize. Elevation was the pattern. But then people naturally get tired of the same thing. We can only have like five years, 10 years of the same pattern. It's why... It's why like Coritos got out of style because it, it just was a pattern. And even Coritos was an anti-pattern to a pattern that existed before it. So every generation comes and they want to create a new pattern that is in rebellion to the previous pattern. So elevation was the pattern. And if you're following that pattern and as a musician, you're kind of tired of that pattern. Nothing wrong with it, but things just get used over and over again. You step outside of the pattern and you create a new pattern, but then that pattern establishes itself and then it's still the same pattern so it went from elevation and then now it became uh now it's maverick city maverick city like five years ago or i don't know again i'm so ignorant to this they started doing that spontaneous worship type of style and that was incredible but now that's the pattern everybody's doing spontaneous you know worship in that type of way and that's beautiful, but I'm, that's what I've recognized is the pattern right now. And I'd rather say pattern than to say trend. Trend sounds negative, right? I don't want to sound condescending or anything. So pattern, I want to stick with that. I'm not saying it's a trend or what would be like something else. Anyways, it's nothing condescending. But Maverick City is the current pattern. So if we want a new pattern, and that's, I feel like Maverick that, that Maverick City formula, it's already at like the latter end of its cycle and th this is we're in a new place of praise and worship where a new pattern can enter in can tell can you guys tell me if that makes sense can you guys tell me that if that makes sense because what i'm trying to get to with this pattern is that evil is just an anti-pattern of something that already exists the original it's just an anti-pattern but even by the very nature of trying to create an anti-pattern you fall into pattern itself does that make sense and anybody who has ever taken a statistics class they show you this 
uh, with random numbers. If we could uh, do a random number generator, which I actually have one here. Let me show you. Look at this number generator here. I have 49 numbers here, ones and twos. This looks like a, a number generator. If I keep hitting again here, it's going to show a different subset of random numbers, right? Every time I do it. If I was to ask you guys to create 49 numbers, you would actually create a, as, as much as you would love to be random about something, eventually we can figure out the pattern of what you're doing. And if you do it long enough, we'll figure out that your random pattern is not random at all because we're logical creatures. We work and see everything as a pattern, no matter how creative we are. So if you can understand patterns, right? If you can understand patterns, that's the true creativity. So true creativity is not, is not this freedom or liberation from the pattern itself. True creativity is understanding the pattern and knowing what to do with it to create a new pattern. So what evil does is it just takes something that was already good and it creates its own pattern. So if you can see it like that, hope this is this is basically the, the essence of what I'm trying to tell you. This is how I can go watch Dune. I could watch Star Wars or Harry Potter or whatever else, or I could go to Universal or I could go to Disney. I could do all these things because I'm not engaging these things haphazardly. I'm not engaging them unconsciously and allowing the agency of these things to have its influence over me. That's where I will say you can't enjoy the thing that I'm talking about. You're not ready for this level of worship with God, because if you can't understand the pattern that they are distorting, then you are not ready because then the pattern that they are distorting becomes law and code to you. And then it has agency and power and influence over you. But since I understand the pattern, I'm like, okay, I see the pattern. With Dune, they talk about the Mahadi. Who the Mahadi is, if anybody's Arabic here and knows anything about Islam, the Mahadi is the Messiah of the Is Islamic religion. So the Mahadi is who's the central figure in the movie and is basically... Islam the movie is Islam so even as a Christian there's even Christian elements to it because all Islam is is a anti-pattern to the Christian pattern so if I know that walking in or even not knowing anything about Dune when it's projecting itself on me because this is what everything is everything is projecting itself onto you what is this set of flowers doing to your to your psyche at this moment you know what it's doing? Currently, the pattern of this beautiful arrangement for my mysterious woman of my imagination somewhere in the pattern of the mind of God, whatever she wants to show up, right? This pattern here, what it, it should be evoking some type of peace towards you. It should be evoking something in you, right? And why is that? Because this has a specific pattern. The combination of the pink with the subtlety of the blended white with the green that goes from dark to light into the water, all these things in the, in the clear glass, there is a specific pattern that is projecting itself onto you. Your eyes are receiving that information and it's decoding the pattern and something's being processed in your mind that you now associate this with beauty. Are you understanding? So if I can see it like that, I can appreciate the beauty for what it is. But in the same token, if I understand that everything is a pattern, when I engage something that normally would be a threat to me, I can recognize the pattern, study the pattern, and then that pattern no longer has influence on me. Does that make sense? And if you're not ready to do that, if you don't understand what the basic pattern is, which this is the pattern of all the universe here, right here. If you're not familiar with the narrative that exists here, you will you will in your own way distort the narrative and the pattern itself intrinsically because you don't understand the narrative and the pattern that exists as the original. You don't understand it. Everything finds its basis from the original pattern. Are we making sense here? 
And then just to show you guys what I'm talking about, all these things, so to give you a visual, because I'm a visual person. This is what a fractal pattern looks like. Everything in the world, everything in existence, everything in the universe. What the? Um, what happened? Oh, here we go. Everything in the universe exists on this fra fractal pattern. Everything exists to some degree can be reduced to a, a specific pattern. Look at that. If you can even look at at these flowers, they have some type of fractal pattern. Right? Look at this. This is a fractal pattern. And this is why we find things beautiful. Is because of its symmetrical nature. To some degree, it exists in a pattern. So look at this. Right? Fractals in nature. Fractal comes from um, math, by the way. Right? These things are beautiful because of the patterns that exist. And just to give you more examples of, of patterns is like snowflakes. We've we've all seen that. Excuse me. This is a pattern here. So just to make sense of this, why is this important? Again, I'm, I'm trying to bring home the point. We've only been on one. <laughs> we've only been on one verse and I'm going to come back to it. I promise. I'm just trying to make the point. So if the pattern, if you understand that this is the schematic, this is the original pattern, Paul talks about to the in to the Colossians, the church of Colossae, he says that don't subject yourself to the elementary spirits that once dominated you, to once you were slaves. They the 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 principles, the principalities of the world. Don't engage that pattern again. That's what you were set free from. The pattern that comes from above, right? He talks about how the, you know, like even when when God gives Moses the pattern for the, or the schematic for the temple, he says, these are the shadows of things in heaven. These are the things that you are doing because in heaven it exists. So everything on a micro level to the greatest level exists on some type of pattern. And it goes from that smallest thing all the way to the largest from here on the earthly plane all the way to the heavenlies both in the physical and the spiritual because people think that the spiritual is here and the physical is here that's not the way the bible explains it the bible explains the physical and the spiritual meeting together like this where there is parts that's not affected by the other but they intertwine and intersect in very specific ways so there is this fractal pattern that exists that demonstrates the ultimate good in the world are, are we are you guys following that so if you can understand that then you can understand how uh, paul says everything is good but not everything is beneficial right what did he say uh to the pure in heart everything is good but not everything is beneficial so you can engage these things and on the basis of how you engage them you know, it could be good or not. So verse two, and I guess we'll have to leave it there. I'm so sorry. That was so long winded. But I, I think that if we don't understand that, then we can't understand the next part, which is do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind that by testing you may discern what is the will of god what is good and acceptable and perfect so does it make sense what i'm saying now in regard to paul adding that as a backdrop i'm not saying that's the exact thing that paul has in mind but do not be conformed to this world what does that mean don't be conformed to the patterns of this world but be transformed by the renewal of your mind the word renewal in this verse in Greek means like a brain transplant. It's like transplanting, like from the good to the to the new, right? So you're you're getting you're not associating or allowing yourself to be influenced by the patterns of this world, but you are being transformed by the pattern that is of God. That by testing the two patterns, you may discern what is the will of God so that you could see what is good and acceptable and perfect. 
Because when you see what's good and what's acceptable and perfect, you see the original pattern that is the will of God. Are you guys following me in that? So this is why I think music is so important. Um, entertainment is so important because if you're not careful, you'll subject yourself to patterns that you don't even you don't even realize have influence and agency over you. And when you allow something to have influence and agency over you without you realizing, that's very dangerous. And this is controversial. Um, hmm, how can I say this? I'm not going to say it. I'm not going to say it. Never mind. Let me, I, I'm not going to say it. I was going to get into like specific things regarding music, but I've tried to be more gracious in this topic because I'm very passionate about music. You know what I'm saying? Christian music. I cannot stand that people say there's no such thing as Christian music. Christians saying there's no such thing as Christian music. There's just Christians who do music. Okay, brother, brother and sister. Okay, I'm sorry. And I'm going to try to be as gracious as possible with this because you've heard the cliche that there's nothing wrong with these alternative genres of music put whatever you want and this is i would i would love to have a conversation about this with somebody who actually you know is involved in music who could combat my points because i want to know their 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 you know you can't just talk to a straw man basically you know and they understand music in a way that i would never understand however Music itself is one of the most beautiful patterns that exists in all of creation, if not the most beautiful pattern that exists, because God created the world in song. I really believe that God created the world singing. I really believe that. Even the Bible says that when God created the earth, that the sons of God were watching in song. Worship is powerful in the sense of praise worship. And the reason why I think that these alternative genres of music, depending on what it is, it has influence and agency on us before it even has words attached to it. Because a beat can make you feel a certain thing. There's a reason why R&B music is, it puts you in a mood. Why does it put you in a specific mood? Don't you think that's very interesting? It inclines you towards a, a specific pattern, right? You're getting ready to for something, right? Love music, right? That's what they call it. Then there's other music that, for example, like rap music, the beat, the drums, and all of that stuff that that has another type of influence on you. Let's let's get away from let's go to something that I don't know if, if Christians have God to this, but just to drive the point home to show you that music really is a pattern that has ex like one of the most powerful agencies over you. Um, let's talk about war music. When the Romans would go out or the, the, the Visigoths, the Nords or any group of people, it was common practice to have some type of war music how is it that music has the power to put a man in the mode to be willing to die and to kill now let's make this biblical point let's make a biblical point with this because oftentimes i hear the christian rhetoric again that um there's no such thing as christian music there's just music that christians make um that's defeated in the story of uh, king Saul and King da and David. Well, he wasn't the king yet, but King Saul and David. It says that there were demons that were torturing Saul. And how did David exercise those demons? Did he pray to the Lord like, Father God, I, I exercise them in Jesus' mighty name? Did he say that? Did he preach against the demons? Did he read the Psalms to him? Did he you know, call one of the priests or the pastors? No, the Bible says that he grabbed a lyre and he played music. And it seems to indicate that it was just the instrumental that soothed these demons. So there is a such thing as frequencies and instrumentals that have the power over our emotions. So why do I bring this up? 
the the point is not what Christian music you should listen to or not, because I could easily defeat this um, this argument if I was to play devil's advocate. If I was to play the opposition against myself, I could find some of the most creative ways to to say, hey, I don't think that's right. So that's why I would love to have these conversations with a musician because their mind is music. Their mind is worship and praise and in that specific way. Um, I'm just trying to bring the point up of the power of pattern. So if you can recognize that with music, you can recognize it with entertainment or any other pattern in your life. Now you can know there's not really any such thing as there is, but I'm just making an exaggerative statement. There's no separation between you and God, number one. There doesn't have to be. You just make it be. And then you don't have to be afraid of the forces that exist in the world because you can study their pattern and bring it back to its origination. So hopefully that makes sense and that helps you improve in the way that you engage with the world and then also the word of God, recognizing that it's a narrative and it's a pattern that exists in its originality so hopefully that's helpful i know we only did we did a whole hour on two verses isn't that beautiful <laughs> anyways so let's go ahead and um does anybody have any questions or anything before we close out in prayer i just want to make sure i address you guys I do have a post on community posts while you guys are writing. If you type something up, um, I asked you guys for questions for Wednesday, Wednesday's video, preferably if you guys could get to that this weekend by like Monday, I want to, um, do next video in regard to those questions, a whole dedicated video tomorrow's video. I already shot it. I have to, um, I have to edit it and everything. So hopefully you guys will enjoy that. Um, but yeah, I'm starving. I don't see any questions. Comment on the community post and we'll go from there. Father God, we thank you for this day, uh, for the beauty that is your original design. Oh, Lord, we thank you for the patterns that exist in this world. Oh, Father, we ask that you would give us the discernment to be able to see what is the good pattern that you have established for us that we may enter into it, O oh Father, that we may offer our lives, our bodies as living sacrifices, O oh Lord. Teach us, O oh Lord, how to not be conformed to the patterns of this world, O oh Father, but to be transformed by the renewal of our minds as you give us peace that transcends all understanding. Help us know by testing what is good and perfect and acceptable to your good and perfect will, O oh God. I pray for your children in this moment, O oh Father, that you would lead them by your wisdom, Teach us, O oh Father. Help us, O oh Lord, in our weakness. Show us that there is no separation between us and you, that your love is unconditional, O oh Lord. Your love is a love without condition. We love you, O oh Father, and we thank you in this day. Bless your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. So God bless you guys. Thank you for joining. Bean, thank you again for the $20. God bless you. May God repay you 10, 10 to 1. In Jesus' mighty name. So we'll be back on Monday. See ya. Doses. Peace. Nos vemos. Bye-bye.